And so officially, we'll start now. Welcome to our core coffee chat, which is an introduction to power mapping. I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based, or CORE Investments, along with Nicole Young. We're your host today. As you can hear, today's session is held in English with Spanish interpretation. Gisela Carrasco is providing consecutive interpretation right now, and she'll also translate any written comments or questions you have. And soon we'll switch to simultaneous interpretation, which is provided by Stella Lauerman. I'll turn it over to Nicole Young, who's going to give us a brief overview of core investments. Thanks, Nicole. So CORE, as you may know, stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. And we think of it as both a funding model and a broader movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And over the course of many years, CORE has really evolved and we've gathered a lot of input and insights from partners in local government, philanthropy, nonprofits, and community groups. And a number of years ago now, arrived at this mission and this vision statement for core investments that really focus on the parts around collective action, safe, healthy community, equitable opportunities, and that we all share the responsibility for fulfilling that vision and mission. And when we say things like equitable health and well-being, and when we show things like this core conditions graphic, we mean that all people across the lifespan need to have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent, interconnected core conditions for health and well-being, meaning that all people's opportunities and life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse, by things like race, ethnicity, income, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, et cetera, et cetera, all those different ways that we think about social identities and diversity. So as both a funding model and a movement, CORE provides us with a framework to align our priorities, our programs, our policies, our funding, and our results around community-wide goals or impact statements, and then figure out ways to work together to create these core conditions for health and well-being. And equity is at the center of this diagram to illustrate that we have to examine and address our individual and organizational and systemic beliefs and practices and structures that are often the very things that are perpetuating the inequities that we're actually trying to eliminate. And events like today's CORE Coffee Chat are part of the CORE Institute for Innovation and Impact or CORE Institute. So think of the CORE Institute as the learning arm of CORE Investments where we offer an array of training, technical assistance and other learning opportunities for people across all different sectors to build the knowledge and the skills and systems that we need to fulfill that collective vision of an equitable, thriving, resilient community. I'll turn it back to Nicole to review our agenda for today. Thanks, Nicole. So today, as I mentioned, we're going to just provide an overview of the concept of power mapping and some tools that are associated with it. And this is a very quick tour. We're hoping it'll generate um, some more interest and that we'll have some opportunities in the future to do a deeper dive into these kinds of um, approaches and materials and um, encourage more application of them locally and regionally. So consider this just a, um, a sort of teaser of what's available in terms of some of the resources and um, if you are interested in exploring more based on today's um, presentation and or you've already had some experience using these tools, we'd love to hear from you. So stay tuned for that. So the materials we're sharing with you today are drawn from a resource that was prepared by an Oakland-based organization called Human Impact Partners that some of you may know about. And it's specifically a toolkit called Activities to Deepen Your Power Building Analysis. 
It's currently only available in English, but hopefully soon will be available in Spanish as well. And we have just some excerpts of it available in Spanish today. And we'll send those as a follow-up to today's session as well. The tool itself is organized into three chapters that you see in bold here. Assessing your power, which includes a set of activities to understand your own power, both as an individual or the power that you may hold as an organization. A landscape analysis, which is a process we'll review that allows you to systematically identify all of the people and communities and agencies and organizations around you who could either positively or negatively impact the success of your initiative. And then power mapping itself is a section of the toolkit that applies that landscape um, analysis to a specific policy or practice change that you might be working towards. So that's your, your target for change. And it helps you identify some strategic pressure points to make progress um, faster and, and more in a more lasting way. We featured this resource in our recent uh, core newsletter, which we hope you've all seen in your inboxes. And um, this session today is just an opportunity to review it in more depth. And I just wanna point out that all three of the chapters in this toolkit are, are very analytic. They're based on analyzing power and they're a step towards actually building and sharing power, which is the ultimate point, to have a different way of thinking about power and deploying it. So we'll only scratch the surface today, but we really hope this will give you a sense of what power building and power mapping involve, and also um, clue you into some practical tools that are readily available to begin um, or deepen your work in this area. And please feel free to share your questions as we go along. We'll we've set aside some time to address them as best we can. And maybe some of you will be able to answer questions for each other, but just pop them in the chat or raise your hand as we go along. So why do we wanna talk about power? Well, as Nicole mentioned, when she was going over the, the core investments framework, there are systems and structures that lead to the inequities that we see around us. And a lot of these power imbalances um, and structural oppression are really the root causes of these inequities. So unless we try to address those power imbalances, we don't really have as much of a chance to, um, to change the, the root causes of those inequities. And it may seem obvious, but power is important to acknowledge and discuss because it's powerful. And we know that these kinds of imbalances and oppression, things like racism, patriarchy, capitalism, and others are root causes of so many inequities. These forces are um, interlocking with each other and interdependent, which makes them even harder to change. So um, because these forces work together to maintain current conditions and status quos. They keep us from accessing the collective resources that we need to thrive and to live free and healthy lives. And because these power imbalances get so cemented over time, they often seem overwhelming and very hard to shift or even undo. And that's why this work is so important. It shows us how to understand power and work to change those imbalances in power. You may have heard the term upstream related to where we can intervene um, and focus our efforts. Because power imbalances and structural oppression are the most upstream root causes of the inequities that we're trying to change, they tend to be the most impactful sites for intervening. So change starts with understanding our own power at the individual, team, organizational, and system levels. The Human Impact Partners Toolkit um, shares this great quote from Martin Luther King, that power is the ability to achieve a purpose, whether or not it is good or bad depends on the purpose. So just keep that in mind as we talk about power throughout this session. 
So one distinction that is important to keep in mind is the notion of personal power versus collective power. When we think about power, we often think about personal empowerment, which typically means helping individuals to better navigate a system or condition as it is, in, in essence, to become advocates for their own situation. So for example, a public health campaign might focus on how to empower individuals to make healthy choices like eating healthy foods or getting more exercise or quitting smoking. And the tool would be health education that helps people um, learn more about a, a way to be healthier themselves. Or maybe um, some support could help people navigate a confusing maze like a healthcare system or an education system or a housing uh, system. So that's a step up from, from just um, holding someone personally responsible for change. And supporting the empowerment of people to do these things is really important. However, it has limited impact, particularly for those who are most affected by inequities. So for example, using our nutrition education idea, that doesn't really work if the person who's trying to receive that education about nutrition isn't paid a living wage and can't afford healthier food or exercise recommendations aren't helpful for someone whose neighborhood has no safe outdoor green space or safe sidewalks. So these fixes fall into more of a Band-Aid category and ultimately put the burden on people and communities who are already experiencing inequities and focus all of the effort on individuals rather on, than on the systems that are creating these conditions. That's why power building initiatives focus so much on structural change to really support health and well-being for everyone. Personal empowerment and provision of better services are fine as they go for some, but they're not ultimately sufficient to achieve the goal of health and well being for all. They leave too many people out. So, collective power, where many people are working together in an organized, aligned, and strategic way to change the systems and conditions that affect our lives, accelerate the type of changes that alter these systems and outcomes. Collective power is good for one's health in and of itself, it gives you a sense of agency. But in addition to having a bigger impact on the social determinants of health, individual power is most useful when it catalyzes a group of people to work together. So in other words, collective power for the larger system level changes that are needed to eliminate health inequities. So another way to think about power and how it's deployed is the, the um, idea of power over versus power with. And the, again, this is terminology from the Human Impact Partners Toolkit. We don't have to look very hard to see power over in our society. We see it play out all the time. This is when a select few groups have enormous capacity to shape our laws, to shrink government services, to control narratives, to repress legislation and policies and protests that threaten their hold on political and economic power. And even if we happen to gain access to this type of power, using a power over mindset in our work tends to perpetuate inequities rather than addressing them and changing them. In contrast, a power with framework accepts that power is actually infinite and generative. It's not a scarcity mindset or a zero sum game type approach. The more we share power, the more it expands in this view. And shifting to this mindset can help people work within systems and conceive of how to share power with community members and organizers. Sharing power creates space for centering voices of those who are most impacted by health inequities and can then shift the power imbalances that cause those inequities in the first place. But it can be a tough sell. The human impact partners and others call this an inside outside approach. And we can talk more about that in a subsequent session, but that's the idea that within agencies and places that hold power, the 
Um, the process of sharing power with outsiders can be hard to initiate and to sustain, but it's ultimately what keeps um, accountability going and helps efforts move further upstream. So as you're hearing and, and probably already know, there are so many different dimensions of power or different ways to categorize these different forms of power. And these um, concepts here are from the Grassroots Power Project, which outlines three distinct but related forms of power. So the first that you see here is organizing people and resources to influence decisions. This is the form of power that's the most visible. It includes things like educating, advocating, lobbying, registering voters, particularly important this time of year, organizing campaigns to influence policies and elections. And this form of power tends to have a short-term uh, time frame, pretty specific targets. The second is power and infrastructure that aims to influence what's on the agenda. This is usually more hidden. It's used to influence which issues get addressed and who is sitting at that decision-making table. So actions here might include shifting or expanding the political agenda through building collective infrastructure and coordinating strategic alliances and networks that, that create uh, pressure and influence. This form of power tends to be more of a midterm or longer term timeframe than the first. And then the third is shifting narratives and worldviews to, to try to shape what's possible. This typically is invisible or less visible. It's used to influence how people consciously and unconsciously interpret the world around them, shaping things like an ideology or an approach. Narratives impact what people see as problems and also importantly, what they see as possible solutions. So the, the way that narratives impact what people see as problems can, um, can constrain what they see as solutions. Actions here include using communications to activate key values and beliefs and challenging dominant worldviews to shape the public debate. You may have heard us talk about framing in, in prior um, core coffee chats, and that's a lot of what framing is about, is how to, how to speak to common values and try to shape the discussion about both what the underlying issue is and how it could be addressed. So again, thinking back to that Martin Luther King quote, power in and of itself isn't good or bad. It's what we do with that power that really matters. And so all of these materials are trying to get us to think more intentionally about the power that we do or do not have and how to build it and how to use it. So with that, I'll turn it over to Nicole Young, who's gonna go over a few of the tools that are part of the toolkit. Okay, thanks. And again, I um, encourage all of you to check out the actual toolkit that uh, and Gisela posted the link in the chat. Maybe you can do that again, Gisela, for any of the newcomers, because there's so much rich content and Nicole did a really fabulous job of summarizing um, some of the key concepts. But uh, I know for myself, when I was reading through it to prepare for this coffee chat, it really sparked a lot of uh, insights <clears throat> and ideas about sometimes how we talk about power and sharing power and whether we actually or how we actually go about doing that. And um, for me, it, I found it to be a really helpful uh, kind of reflection opportunity to think about, hmm, <laughs> am I walking the talk? Uh, and, you know, and what are, what are the ways that we can um, all do better at that um, collectively? Um, and I find too that sometimes I, I know I find myself in a lot of meetings where, you know, it's some kind of a um, change effort, collaborative effort. And oftentimes one of the questions that's posed to the group early on is something like, who's here at the table and who's missing? So it's kind of a power discussion, but without some of this analysis that we're talking about here. And so some of these tools that we are highlighting today are a way to remind us to, to, to go through those steps, to not take 
too many shortcuts when we do this kind of power analysis and power building because there's real value in doing things like this activity, uh, which is in the first chapter on assessing your power. Uh, it's around identifying your powers. And so this activity can be really valuable because it, one, because it acknowledges there are different forms of power. And so what you're seeing here on the slide are 12 forms of power that are uh, described and defined in the toolkit. Giselle has also posted a link to a bilingual handout that we created with Human Impact Partners permission, where we basically just recreated the table in their toolkit that lists each of the forms of power and the brief definition. And then you'll see in the table, there's a column if you're doing this activity to then have a discussion about does your organization or your group that's working on some kind of change, do you have that form of power? And so it, this basically provides a structured way to engage others in your group or in your agency in an explicit discussion about the forms of power that your group or organization has or that you don't have. Um, and so again, we're just showing here all 12 of the forms of power um, we're not going to describe each one of them in detail today, just because of the amount of time that we have, but just wanted to show them all here because when you think about these different forms of power, not all of them are always recognized as power or, or that they are powerful. Uh, they're not always, um, perceived as valuable forms of power. And so they can be, um, kind of discounted or, or minimized. And this is really reminding us that there are all different ways that each one of us holds power and can own that power and contribute it for some kind of um, change effort. Um, I like that. I like this reminder because oftentimes I also hear the things like, especially in the, I want to say in the kind of human services world that we're like, we tend to shy away from or not want to uh, be seen as like, too powerful or exerting power over. And so we tend to try to minimize the amount of power that we have. Like, oh, I'm not, I'm not the decision maker. I don't have power. But really this is saying like, like it or not, <laughs> we all have one or more forms of power. And so again, going back to that Martin Luther King Jr. quote, it's not so much that power is a good or bad thing. It's, it's the, it's the purpose and what we do with it that matters. So if we look at the next slide, these are just a handful of um, those forms of power. So we'll just, I'll just briefly describe them, but I want you to think about um, realistically and honestly, like which, you know, if you think about the group or agency you work with, which of these forms of power does your group or people in your agency have? So there's positional power is one of the examples, meaning it, that that's power that comes from your organization's authority or the position it holds. Um, sometimes it, it comes with a you know formal decision-making authority. Sometimes it just has to do with visibility or kind of how you're perceived as uh, you know a group or, or an organization that has, again, some kind of um, authority or uh, kind of validity that others might not have. And so the thing about positional power is that it's often overlooked by people that are in power that have that kind of power. Um, but the people that don't have that power are almost constantly reminded that they don't have it. Right? So position in terms of where your organization or group sits, how it's perceived, whether you have formal decision-making authority, Another type, form of power is expert power. And this comes from the wisdom, the knowledge, the experience, the skills that people in your organization or your group have. Sometimes it's um, tangible, uh, demonstrable wisdom, knowledge, experience that like you can point to and say, and people can see where that wisdom and knowledge and experience comes from. Sometimes it's more hidden and it's not recognized or it's not named or it's not valued. And so sometimes the, um, the in terms of building power, it comes from like naming it and recognizing it and valuing it and welcoming it um, from all different people in your organization. 
Another form of power is obstructive power. And so this is about your organization or your group's ability to coerce or change or block a particular action or decision, um, either through just kind of implied messaging, or maybe it's some kind of a threat, or maybe it's some kind of an action, you know, that you can, that's demonstrated. And again, obstructive power could be used, and I'm just going to use the words good or bad, right, just to make it simple, it could be used for good positive purposes, or kind of negative, harmful, bad purposes, depending on where you stand on an issue, right? So obstructive could mean that you're using that power to actually block an action that you think will be harmful to a community. So that's actually using power for good. Sometimes obstructive power is used to just block something that someone doesn't like when actually that change, that policy, that program, whatever it might be, could actually be helpful to people. And so obstructive power, again, could be used for better or for worse. And then there's collaborative power. Um, and so that really speaks to a group's or an organization's ability to join forces with, to join energies, to uh, you know share resources in partnership with others in order to work towards a common goal. So based on just those brief descriptions of this handful of these forms of powers, uh, which of these forms of power do you think the group or agency or coalition that you work with currently has? And so just pause for a second, encourage you to invite you to share your answers in the chat. Tell us, and it could be just one of these forms of power. It could be all these forms of power. Tell us in the chat when you think about the group or organization you work with and the type of work that you do types of changes you're trying to create, what forms of power do you have? Nora says all of the above. Any other? Rocio says expert. All right, last call. Any other answers anyone wants to share in the chat before we move on? Okay, feel free to, to add additional answers in the chat if you'd like, but I'll end this uh, little piece on this particular tool with a few tips. If you are going to uh, conduct some kind of activity or exercise around identifying your groups or organizations power, here are a few tips that are included in that toolkit from Human Impact Partners. That first you would wanna review all the forms of power and the the definitions, maybe even generate some examples before you complete something like the table that is in that Google Doc that um, that Gisela shared, where again, you're looking at the form of power, the definition, and then you're asking, do we have this? You could even use, you know, make it a visual exercise or activity using, you know, dots or sticky notes as a way to, to show kind of for each individual in your organization where you think you have what forms of power. Because then the really interesting part of this activity comes from the discussions that happen when you step back and look at the patterns or themes that emerge, particularly where there are areas of agreement around, oh yes, we all in our group, in our organization, we all you know think similarly around, these are the forms of power that we have or don't have. But also any areas where there's differences of opinion or disagreements about the forms of power that you have, because that says something. That might say something about the types of power dynamics that exist within your organization. Um, different people in your group or organization may have different experiences. And so those are all really worthwhile things um, to flesh out. Because then you can have a discussion about how do we do more to share the powers that we have as a group or organization how do we share those with others? And then really use that power with framework instead of a power over one. Okay, and Nicole's going to move us on to the next tool. Thanks, Nicole. So the next tool is um, the landscape analysis that helps you identify both potential partners and potential or actual opponents. So, um, it's from the chapter of the toolkit that's specifically called landscape analysis. It's just a structured way to identify partners and opponents who may have 
an interest or an influence over the policy or practice that you want to change. So the first thing that you need to do is to identify that change. So what is your change target or goal? Is it a change in policy or practice? Is it to create a new program or perhaps a brand new coalition or a different coalition than something that's already in place? The more specific your goal is, the better, because then you can use these questions on this slide to help brainstorm a list of key potential partners and possible opponents. So you might wanna, for example, ask who would be most impacted by the change that you have in mind and which organizations or individuals are already working towards this change. So maybe they're allies that you haven't connected with yet. Who has the actual decision-making power to approve your change? And who's responsible for implementing it? And importantly, who holds them accountable for both the decision-making and the implementation? Sometimes trying to influence the accountability part of this as opposed to the decision-making or implementation part of it can be more effective as a pressure point, but this kind of questioning and discussion helps you try to identify where those levers might be. And then which organizations or individuals, again, could provide you with data or resources or other forms of support? So it doesn't just have to be a uh, compilation of who has power over decisions um, and changes. It might be who can influence those changes in those ways. So once you have had a chance to brainstorm a list of those potential partners and potential opponents or blocking uh, forces, you could fill out a table like this one and it helps you analyze what each organization or individual is responsible for implementing. So how does that relate, for example, to your change target or your specific goal? What relevant powers they might have? So maybe they are they have some electoral or legislative power, maybe they're administrative um, and have influence that way. Maybe they're, they're influential in other ways by having sort of a, a, um, a cultural power over decisions and, and implementation. And then as we mentioned earlier, who are they accountable to? Who do they report to? How is their budget determined? Who has influence over that? Maybe it's community members or shareholders of a company or a board of directors for a nonprofit. Maybe there's um, elected officials locally like mayors, city councils, legislative staff, um, and of course, funders and, and voters in our, in our system. And then you wanna know who and what influences them, who has sway over them. So um, there are many potential answers to these questions and they do overlap. And sometimes the reason we go through this type of exercise systematically is because there can be some surprises or different types of knowledge housed in your organization. Maybe somebody has an insight that is not obvious or um, apparent to others. And then finally, what type of relationship do you and your colleagues have? Um, are they formal relationships? Are they informal relationships? Maybe it's something that's outside of the, um, the formal relationship. So in your work life, you don't know them, but you're in a bowling league or you attend the same uh, type of worship or something. Um, so there, this is, again, just exploring what you know, what you still might need to know, and where your points of connection and understanding and insight might be so that you can be as informed as possible. And then here's the same information in Spanish. So again, just looking at what the organization or individual implements, their relevant powers, who they're accountable to, who they're influenced by, and the nature of your relationship or your potential relationship with them, both formally and informally. 
And if you decide to do something like this activity, you might end up with um, something like this landscape web that is just trying to map out the connections that those lines are a little faint on this, um, this diagram, but you can see how this one is for a public health agency um, connected to all of these different potential partners and, and sources of influence and accountability. So there are different, you can see that there are some professional relationships, there's some as partners, there's some client relationships, there's some more informal partners, there's some um, groups that are required just to do the work that they're doing. So they're just different types of connections, but the first step is listing them out to see if you can um, then have the subsequent discussions about what is hidden behind each of those lines and how you can use them to advantage for the target, um, the policy goal or target ch targeted change that you seek. I'll turn it back over to Nicole for some more mapping advice. Okay, so assuming you've done the activities and some kind of analysis that are suggested in those first couple chapters of this toolkit, then you're ready to, to start doing some power mapping. Um, but even if you haven't had a chance to do kind of the full set of suggested activities leading up to it, you still wanna have some discussion to prepare yourselves, your group, your organization for the power mapping. So that's uh, this last tool that we'll focus on here. Um, and power mapping is just really meant to help deepen your understanding of the power landscape. Again, the who, the what, the how, um, related to your specific change target or goal. Okay? So before you actually start doing a power mapping activity, you'll wanna make sure that you've had a chance to discuss questions like these with your group, with your organization, um, especially if you haven't already done them through activities around identifying your forms of power and doing a landscape analysis. So getting really clear about what is your change target? What is it, what is the thing or person, right? That you're trying to influence or change? How does power and influence play out in the context of that change? So that's where that landscape analysis would come in handy to think through like, uh, you know, what are those dynamics that happen? What are the typical discussions or actions that that happen? Because that's really what you're trying to shift or change or disrupt. What does it mean to be aligned with your change target? Whether it's a policy change or again, a person that you're trying to influence or, or kind of shift or shape their thinking, that it helps to think through in advance, you know, what are the values and expectations or shared understanding that really are kind of underpinning your goal for change. And so what are the signs of alignment that you would be looking for or would give you that sense of, okay, yes, we there are others who are in agreement or working collectively with us versus, you know, getting that feeling you're always <laughs> kind of um, you know, butting heads or, or in a tug of war. And again, which key partners or opponents and or opponents should be mapped. And so, if you you would want to have that discussion if you haven't already done a landscape analysis, but this would also be a helpful point to take a look at that list if you did do a landscape analysis and you may want to prioritize or trim down your list because that will make your power mapping a little bit more feasible versus you know casting too wide of a net and then getting overwhelmed with <laughs> the number of, of people and, and um, uh, potential partners and opponents to be mapping. So if you look at the next slide, you'll see a template or a, a structure um, to do power mapping. And it's actual, you know, we're showing this visual that's in the toolkit. So you can see that, you know, you, you'll want to use something like this grid that then um, has four quadrants. So you're thinking about what is the degree of power that each of those potential partners or opponents has. That's, that's why starting with fewer might be helpful before you expand. So what is the uh, degree of power that they have from very low, meaning that that, that that person, that that group, that entity isn't on anyone's radar, so they have very little power, 
all the way up to that group or that individual or that entity has decisive decision-making power or influence. So the very highest. So the power is on the vertical axis, the degree of support that that person or entity has, again, specifically related to your change goal or change target, all the way from die hard against on the far left to die hard supports all the way on the far right. So again, think of that as a continuum there. So when you kind of look at the intersection of those um, of those two axes, then you end up with these four quadrants. So the top left quadrant mean represents high power, a lot of decision making, power, influence, but low support for the issue or change that you're trying to create means that that's a person or group that has the potential to to derail your change efforts. And so you might not be able to completely change everyone's minds, but it's definitely worth kind of keeping track or staying up to date with what their actions and messaging or arguments are. Depending on how strongly they oppose what you're working on, it's, you know, you may find there's room to gain some buy-in, shift their support, right? If you look at the lower left quadrant, low power and low support. That's if you're finding that you're, as you're mapping, kind of figuring out where people fall, you know, your potential partners and opponents, where you would place them in these quadrants. If you're finding that there are people or groups that fall in this lower left quadrant, low power, low support, that's probably a group or a, or set of individuals where you don't need to spend much time trying to influence them, uh, you know, try to change their minds because they have low power, low support, your energies are better spent somewhere else. The quadrant in the lower right, so low power, low to, you know, moderate power, but high support for your issue or your change target means that's a group that would most likely support your goals. And so you want to explore ways to collaborate with any potential partners and maybe even possible opponents to figure out are there ways to collaborate to build collective power and grow influence. But really that top right quadrant, high power, high support is where you really will find your strongest partners. You'll wanna look closely at how you build power, share resources to achieve your goals. If you have to choose where to prioritize, where to focus your efforts, right? That green box, that green quadrant is where you'd want to focus. So we have this power map example here in English. And then the next slide, you'll see it's in Spanish. So you'll see that we've translated portions of the toolkit for today's coffee chat. Soon, um, uh, the, the whole toolkit we think will be available in Spanish. And so let's say you've done this kind of mapping exercise as a group. You know, again, you can use visual techniques like using you know, sticky notes to, you know, write a name of each potential partner or opponent on a sticky note and figure out where to place them on your map. And then you have discussions to help you make meaning of that, right? So who, as you look at the results of your power map, talk about things like who should you consider shifting from one quadrant to another or, you know, along an axis, who should you consider shifting and why? And in what way do they need to shift? Right? Are you trying to increase the power or increase support? And what would it take to shift them? And if you, again, if you've done the earlier exercises and analysis, you'll be much better positioned to have these kind of discussions to make meaning of your power map. Again, a few tips. If you decide to do this on your own, these are some tips from, again, the Human Impact Partners Toolkit. They actually say that power mapping should take no more than two hours like that actual exercise of placing on those quadrants. It's assuming that you've done some of the analysis, the other activities beforehand, but if you find that it's taking the actual mapping process, if you find that it's taking longer than two hours, it may be that because there are things like, you know, your change target was too broad, like you kind of like it's too broad in general. And so you need to choose a more focused change target so you can get really specific and concrete It helps you prioritize your list of potential partners and opposition for the mapping activity. Because if it's too extensive, if your list of partners and opposition is too extensive, it just, it can get really unwieldy. Um, 
if it's taking a long time, it might mean that you have too little knowledge of the partners and opponents. So you need to go back and do a little bit more research or do research ahead of time. Um, or your team might not have full agreement or shared understanding of the meaning of power or alignment in relation to your change target. And so again, on the front end, if you can do it, make sure you build in time to build those team agreements on power definitions ahead of time. Or if you need to pause and have those conversations again in your power mapping exercise, that can also help um, just create a uh, more uh, useful, coherent uh, power map that's useful. So that was our, whirl our whirlwind tour of activities to deepen your power building. Um, so we'll pause here just to see if there are any questions that come to mind based on the things you, you heard us describe or the documents that we've shared in the chat. And has anyone been part of a power mapping journey of any kind? Or been been the target of one? <laughs> I'll just show that I, I know I've both participated in and led some power mapping activities, but they're very, they're like standalone activities. It's kind of like mm -hmm. a do it for the purpose of learning a process or a tool, but not necessarily as part of a, um, you know, actual plans initiative or structured initiative. And so I know that to me, that was one of the really valuable things of understanding you know the toolkit and how to use it and maybe think about things in a different way if we were to feature um in a future core coffee chat uh, more concrete examples of how someone has actually used this locally is that something that people would be interested in rosa says yes thank you Nora, too. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you know of a particular example, um, we are happy to explore that. I'm curious, um, again, knowing that we went through some really uh, <laughs> uh, nuanced, rich content in the toolkit in a very short amount of time. I'm curious, do, um, do any of you feel like you're likely to go back and look at the toolkit and and try out some of these exercises or activities on your own in your own projects or programs? Do you see yourself using any of these tools? Great, see a yes in the chat, anybody else? Absolutely, some thumbs up, great. Nice, okay. Any other and does any, any other questions before we move to our wrap up and highlight some of the upcoming and core events? Okay, so coming up in October, it's hard to believe that uh, <laughs> we're already at October. Uh, we have two events, two core events scheduled for October. October eighth is one of our joint trainings with DataShare Santa Cruz County. Uh, we're going to be focusing on understanding demographic data and particularly the demographic data that's available in DataShare. Some of you have already uh, discovered it and may have even used it, especially for recent core funding applications. But we'll also talk about kind of, you know, really how do you make sense of the demographic data that's on there? What are some tips and caveats for, um, you know, using disaggregated data? by things like race, ethnicity, gender, you know, what do you do when data isn't available because the sample size or numbers are too small? So a lot of, uh, we hope, practical tips uh, in that training. And then October 15th, you, some many of you may know, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, and so we have Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center and Monarch Services will be our guest presenters sharing some of the 
current thinking and approaches to, to domestic violence prevention and responses, and uh, as well as some of the events that they're both hosting in October. Uh, so Gisela has posted the link to the core events page in the chat. That's the best place to find the descriptions and the registration links. We'll also be sending out the October core newsletter next week. Um, so you'll see that there as well. And then last but not least, we ask you to share your feedback with us about today's core coffee chat. You can either click the link in the chat. Um, it's a bilingual survey, but you can either answer it in English or Spanish, um, or you can scan the QR code if you have a smartphone with a camera and you can fill it out online. We really appreciate feedback. We always look at it and pay attention to it and use it to help us think about ways we can continuously improve our core events. And so we just wanna thank you for being here today. Thank you as always to Gisela and Stella for providing our bilingual meeting support. We definitely could not do this without you. And we'll stay on for a few more minutes in case anybody does have lingering questions or comments. Otherwise, we are done, officially done with this session and I uh, just want to say good to see everyone and hope to see you again at a future CORE Institute event.